going to look at um, some functions that appear frequently in quantum field theory calculations. Um, in particular, there's a function called the Feynman propagator. Um, so when we come to look at the interaction between fields, and we're going to study their interaction uh, in perturbation theory, we're going to find that the answers to the problems that we that we are trying to solve, for instance, you know, probabilities for certain kinds of processes, uh, scattering cross sections, um, and so on, we find that certain kinds of functions, certain kinds of functions appear frequently over and over again in the in the in the results. So there's a particular function called the Feynman propagator that's very important. So um, what I'm going to do in this lecture is we're going to talk about this function and some related functions for the case of the real klein gordon field. Um, so today we're going to look at the real klein gordon So the Feynman propagator for the real klein gordon field, and then later the generalization is easy. Generally, when we come to look at the other fields, the complex klein gordon field, the Dirac field, the electromagnetic field, the generalization is this sort of, sort of obvious really. So, um, all right, so what we're going to do is first of all, so Norberto Davila is not, uh, is he given up after the midterm exam or is he still coming? Anyway, um, okay, so before we get to the Feynman propagator, we're going to look at a related function that comes up. Um, in the following calculation, let us look at commutation relations. Commutation relation at, so we're going to look at the field. We're not going to be looking at the momentum density, just the field commutation relation at unequal time. Now, what do I mean? Is we, you know that the you know that if you look at the field operator at two different points in space at equal times, uh, they commute. Um, so here, if you think of it at a, at a given time, if you're on a, 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 a looking at a fixed time and you're looking at the field operator at two different points in space, they commute. You know that already. So here is a question, well what happens if the times are unequal? What is this equal to? So might be looking at point xt and the point x prime t primed and you might ask well do they commute do they not commute what what is the value um, this is an interesting question that has some physical significance as, as we'll see um, let me just first write you down what the answer is, and we'll talk about the answer a bit, and then I'll go back and quickly sketch um, how it's derived, and then maybe even fill in some of the details as homework. So the answer, here is the answer um, for the case of a 
of course, again, we're looking at the real, we're looking at the real flying ball of the field. Keep it simple, but as I said, all of this generalizes immediately uh, to, to the other field. So, here's the answer. Let's first write this as, let's just write it in a simpler notation. Positions. So the answer is the if I look if I look at the commutator of the Klein Gordon field at two arbitrary space time points, just to confuse you, instead of calling them x and x prime, I'm going to follow the notation in the book we call them x and y. Okay, x and y are two arbitrary um, By y, two arbitrary space-time points. Okay, y is not the y-coordinate free space. Y is the position of. So let me change this. I'm shifting around notation. Keep you on your toes. Let's talk about two points here. Here is a space-time point x. Here's a space-time point y. And the question is, there we go, let's tidy this up here. Um, the question is, what is the value of this commutator? All right, so the answer is the following. It's i times a function called delta, which is related to the Feynman propagator, but it's not quite the Feynman propagator. A certain function delta where delta, if I just write the argument as, as an x, is given by the following formula, minus 1 over 2 pi cubed times the integral over the wave vector k of 1 over omega sine k dot x. This is the answer. That's not supposed to be obvious. If it's not, if you're wondering where that comes from, don't worry, we'll, we'll come to it. But this is the answer. Um, so omega is, of course, plus m squared and k dot x k dot x is just omega t minus k dot x so this integral over k so omega is also a function of k this is a function of x and t, function of, of on space. It's a function of, of position in space and of time. Anyway, this is the answer. Now, let's first look at, um, let's just check. We're gonna, I'll show you when, I'll show you how to derive this. But for the moment, let's just look at this. And just check, hang on, it should be the case that if I put, so what does this mean? So it means that if I had y is equal to pi times, just trying to draw in here, i times this function minus 1 over 2 pi cubed integral d3. Omega under there, and this is sine k dot x minus. 
as y. Now, this is supposed to be, let's just check that if x0 is equal to y0, i.e., if we are at equal times, then this should equal 0. So let's just check this. Well, k dot x minus y is omega x0 minus y0 minus k dot x minus y. And if x0 is y0, if we are at equal times, this is minus k dot x minus y. So our integral, our commutator is proportional to the integral d3k over omega, which is the square root of mod k squared plus m squared, times the sine of k dot x minus y. And if you look at that, you realize, well, hang on, the integrand is an odd function of k. And so this is indeed 0. All right, so, OK. It's consistent with what we know, that this has to be, if this is right, well, we still, at equal times, we recover the fact that the commutator is actually 0. All right, what happens? More generally, what happens when the times are unequal? Well, here's something interesting. That this um, function can be rewritten in a form that makes it clear that it's Lorentz, uh, Lorentz invariant. So, Lorentz invariant. or delta of x. So, delta of x can be written as minus i over 2 pi cubed times the integral. We're going to do a four-dimensional integral over k. I'll explain exactly what I mean in a moment. There is a delta function k squared minus m squared. There is a function called epsilon k0, which I'll define, and an e to the minus k dot x. Now, what is this all about? So note, um, d4k here. What do we mean by d4k? We mean it's a four-dimensional integral, a three-dimensional integral of the wave vector k that you're used to, times dk0. We're integrating over k0. The index could be up or down, doesn't matter. Um, where k0 now ranges Freely over minus infinity plus infinity. In particular, note K zero is not restricted to K zero equals omega. So omega is by definition square root of mod k squared plus m squared. Um, in this integral, k0 is not restricted to this. Therefore, therefore now have, what this means is, is that when you allow a wave vector in k0 to range freely in four-dimensional k space, um, in general, you now have k squared not equal to m squared. Okay, so there's something sometimes people like to say uh, physical momentum. 
physical momentum satisfies k squared is m squared. K is, is just the relation, if you, if you think of the um, physical, k is the form momentum. Okay, we've got h bar is 1, so k is just the same as the form momentum. So the form momentum of a particle is just the p squared minus p squared is always m squared for a, you know, a particle of mass m. The physical momentum as k squared is m squared. You'll sometimes hear people talk about virtual momentum. not have to satisfy uh, this relation. Um, hope this is um, I hope this is clear that we have so of course k squared by definition is k zero squared minus k squared and um, if k0 is equal to omega, then k squared equals m squared. If k0 is not equal to omega, then k squared is not m squared. So basically, if k0 is not equal to the physical energy, if you like, of the particle, then anyway. So it's just, all, the, all we're doing, this is just a mathematical expression. We're saying, look, let, let k0 range freely, independently of k. Instead of k0 being fixed by the magnitude of the wave vector, k0 can range freely. And um, sometimes you'll see people call this kind of momentum um, on shell. And here, off shell. So often used in particle physicists, you'll hear this sort of um, jargon. You talk about momentum being on shell or off shell. So you can think of this. Um, you know, this expression k squared is m squared defines a surface in four-dimensional k space. So if you're on that surface, you're on shell. If you're off the surface, you're off shell. And sometimes you'll hear particle physicists saying if someone says something that sounds a bit, a bit sketchy, a bit silly, dubious, says he's going off shell. You know, so you can use the jargon. Press your friends in the bar. They say something a bit weird. You say, you know, you're going off shell. Anyway, so um, so where where does this expression come from? And of course, I haven't uh, told you what this is yet. Um, this, this, this thing here is just the sign of k0. So this is defined to, this is just, well, it's just, it actually, you could just write it as k0 over the magnitude of k0. I mean, frankly, it's a bit silly to introduce a separate notation. You could just write it like this. Anyway, it is equal to plus 1 for k0 positive and minus 1 k0 negative. If you don't want to bother, you can just use, write it directly like that. There's no point in introducing a new symbol. Anyway, it's just the sign of k0. Now, uh, the claim is that that is equal to the function as we wrote it earlier. Um, for we have this expression of omega um, sine k dot x, and the claim is that these are the same. So how do you show that? All right, how do you show that they're the same? Um, so, use the following. So, the delta function, here 
we have a delta function that basically puts you on the shell, okay? In k squared minus m squared uh, is the same as um, this is equal to, so k squared minus m squared is the same as k0 squared minus omega squared. All right, this is just k0 squared minus mod k squared minus m squared, it gives you minus omega squared. And this function, if you remember your properties of delta functions, what happens when you have a delta function of a function that has some points where it vanishes? There's a formula for that. Um, it becomes a sum of delta functions at the points where the function vanishes, divided by the modulus of the gradient of the function. Anyway, if you remember this thing, for this particular case, um, the formula is the following. 1 over 2 omega delta k0 plus om omega plus delta k0 minus omega. Well, and here what I'm doing is just um, using this function here, delta function of a function of x is equal to, um, there are points where the function is zero, should have seen this formula somewhere before. The function has points where it vanishes. Um, then the delta function could be written like this. Anyway, so homework, homework, here's a homework for you. Homework. Show that. Show that. So let's call this formula A. Let's call this formula B. Show that A implies B. By starting with this and writing and splitting the delta function like that, you should be able to show um, without too much grief. There's a little bit of grief. I've got, I've got it here on the back of my page, my own scribble version of the derivation, but I'm sure you can figure it out. Okay, and show that they're actually the same thing. All right, so now we have something interesting. We have something interesting. Why is this interesting? Because it is a consequence of um, um, so remember we said that we have I haven't derived this yet, but I've just written down, written this down, that the commutator of the field at two arbitrary points in space-time is given by I times this function. And now we've written this function in a way that's explicitly Lorentz invariant, and these are, of course, scalar fields. So now there's an interesting consequence that um, we have equal times, we know that, and we've confirmed just checking from that expression of equal times, something that we knew already, that if I write instead of x and x prime, we're using x and y, if we write down the commutator of equal times, this is equal to i times delta of x minus y with time difference equal to zero, and we know that this is zero. Right? The commutator at equal times is zero. So now what we can do for x and t, we've got the commutator at equal times, 
what we can do is a Lorentz transformation to a new frame and um, note that this function is Lorentz invariant so if it vanishes in one frame it will vanish uh, in another frame and so what can we deduce this implies Lorentz transformation that phi hat x phi hat y equals zero now equals i delta x minus y equals zero if x minus y squared is negative. What do I mean? So these two points are space-like separated in the frame that we begin with. They're at the same time, you perform a Lorentz transformation. They're still space-like separated, basically um, by this simple argument. Because the form of this is Lorentz invariant, you can see that, well, hang on. It must be that this function actually vanishes um, for any two points that the space like separated. So what we can deduce is that if we have um, if these points are space like separated. about space like separated is that it would not be possible to send the physical signal from one point to the other because physical signals are bounded by the speed of light. Um, so we have an interesting um, conclusion that the field operator expected physically. When two different operators commute, it means that you can measure them both together without one measurement disturbing the other measurement. So it sort of seems plausible that well if there's space like separate you have two points that are space like separated by measuring the fields of these two different points, if no physical signal can go from one to the other, then it seems reasonable that well they should commute. Um, the hand waving argument there. Um, but this condition in the context of quantum field theory is often called micro causality. Um, it's, it's usually regarded as um, something quite fundamental in quantum field theory. And it turns out to be related to the spin statistics theorem. So, um, so the spin statistics theorem is that, well, um, particles with um, integer spin behave like bosons, particles with half integer spin behave like fermions. Um, it turns out that you, when we, well, I'll, I'll talk about this more when we come to look at the Dirac field, but um, you, you, you might say, well, let's, let's start with, say, the klein gordon field. Could we quantize it in such a way that the field anti-commutes and we get fermions? Or could we take the Dirac field 
And instead of quantizing it in a way with, with anti-commutation relations, which we're going to do, could we quantize it with ordinary commutation relations? So we get bosons. You find that if you try to do this kind of thing, you get a you get a violation of this microcausality condition. So it's generally thought that this this is a deep principle that is related to the relationship between spin and statistics. So, so it's physically uh, quite an important thing. Okay. So. Um, um, We'll look at this again when we come to when we come to do the Dirac field. I'll, I'll show you a little bit about what, what goes wrong if you try to quantize a field with, with the wrong version of the statistics. Okay. Um, all right. So we started out by just writing down this result. Um, but where did this result come from? All right. Let's now just go back and just go through how, how you actually derive this. How do you derive an expression for the commutator at, um, uh, two arbitrary points in space time? So let me just first write down our delta x. We're actually going to construct it from the sum two functions delta plus and delta minus where delta plus is defined to be the following uh, minus i over 2 2 pi cubed integral d3 k k over omega e to the minus i I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong minus i of 2, 2 pi cubed you need to go omega e to minus i k dot k dot x um, and delta minus delta minus, that defines delta plus, what's delta minus? Delta minus of x is just defined to be minus delta plus at minus x. Um, and we are required to prove Required to use this notation RTP required to prove anyway. We're required to prove that the following is true. So how do we do that? All right, quick sketch. So first of all, let's write. Um, Let's write the field. Let's decompose it into the positive and negative frequency parts. Note that this is a plus, not a Hermitian conjugate. Um, the, I always get this wrong. the positive frequency part contains um, annihilation operators only, no creation operators. The negative frequency part contains only creation operators, where this is a, a dagger, not, not a plus. Um, so, so think. This means that the commutator of Phi plus at two different points, any two different points, or the commutator of phi minus at any two different points is going to be zero. Because remember, 
remember, I remember I've got my field expansion. I, I write phi as a sum of a plane wave with A's and A daggers. If I divide the expansion into one half with A's and one half with A daggers, well, here there's going to appear, remember the A's commute with themselves, the A daggers commute with themselves. Um, so clearly, be able to see that by now without even having to write it down. Clearly, these commutators are zero. If I wrote down the series for these, this just contains A's. And here there is just a sum of A's, A's all commute, so everything commutes and the whole thing is zero. So what I can do is if I split phi into the positive and negative frequency parts, I can write the commutator. two arbitrary space-time points, as if I write each phi as a sum of a phi plus and phi minus, this becomes just a sum of these terms. I have the commutator of phi plus with the commutator of phi minus at the two different points, plus a similar term with the minus and the plus the other way around. Now, if you look at this, you should be able to see, well, hang on, if I calculate it, if I calculate this term, I will know this term immediately because I just have to swap. Um, if I swap um, x and y and, and multiply the whole thing by minus 1, I'll get the same thing, maybe think about that. If I swap x and y and then reverse the commutator, I get this here. So in other words, all, in order to calculate this commutator, it boils down to just having to calculate this one here. If we calculate this commutator, then we know everything. All right, so let's calculate that commutator. Um, commutator. So let's look. Phi and oops, uh, plus x phi hat minus y. So remember this term is a sum of what is the usual field expansion but just the part that contains the a's. This is the part that contains just a daggers. If you substitute that in and you take the commutator, you find that the series gives you the following. So you have a double sum, you can have two different expansions. So I have a sum over k and k primed, 1 over the square root of omega, omega prime. There will appear the commutator of a k with the commutator, with, sorry, the commutator of AK with A dagger K prime, and there will appear an E to the minus I, K dot X plus I, K prime dot Y. So you can check this, you can check this, and this commutator is of course the commutator of A and A dagger, is just delta k k primed, and using, of course, the famous correspondence, limit of very large normalization volume, replacing the sum of k by an integral over k, this becomes 1 over 2, 2 pi cubed integral d3k over omega e to the minus i k dot x minus y. And you see here that we've got this, um, this expression here up to a factor minus i uh, because there's an i here and um, Okay, anyway, you can just check the rest, that if this, I've calculated this commutator, I have to add in the other part, where you swap around the x and y and add in a minus sign, you should be able to show the 
the result is I get this function here, which is defined to be delta plus plus delta minus, where delta plus is this, and delta minus that. You can check the rest uh, if you want to go through it and, and just check. So we've got this result. So this is how you derive. Okay, what was the point of this? Is to, is to, is to derive this result of the commutator of the field of two different space-time points is given by i times this function delta, where this function delta can be defined like this, which can then be rewritten in that Lorentz invariant form um, if, if you want to. So, um, all right, so before I move on, straight get the definition and, and a nice way of writing them. So here is another useful way. So uh, useful. This is useful. Believe it or not, this is useful. You can write delta. So let's think of delta plus and delta minus. So remember we defined delta of x, delta plus of x plus delta minus of x. These two functions, delta plus and delta minus, can be written as contour integrals. Contour integrals in the complex k0 plane. So we're going from crazy to crazier. We had, remember, we had a physical k0 is equal to omega, where omega is the square root of mod k squared plus m squared. Then we had a virtual k0, which ranges freely of minus infinity Oops. plus infinity independently of k, independently of the wave vector. Now we're going to look at complex k0. So we are looking at um, we allow k0 to be complex. From the point of view of quantum field theory, this is just a mathematical construction. We allow the variable k0 to be complex. Let's look at its real and its imaginary parts. And there are two points that are particularly interesting. Um, there is the point, there are two points on, on, the real, on the real axis where k0 is equal to, happens to equal omega, and here where k0 happens to equal minus omega. Now, here is um, an expression for these functions as contour integrals. You can write delta plus or minus 
can be written as the following. Minus 1 over 2 pi to the fourth power times the integral over some contours, which I'm going to draw in a second. There are two possible contours. And what are we integrating? e to the minus i k dot x divided by k squared minus m squared. And we're integrating. There's a four-dimensional k integral. What is this four-dimensional k integral? It's d3k dk0, where k0 goes in the complex plane. And what we have are, let me maybe draw this a bit larger to make it clear. Let me draw these contours. Um, two points I've drawn here, k0 is minus omega, k0 is plus omega. So c minus, this is the contour, c minus. It's just a curve going around this point where k0 is minus omega. Here's the point k0 is plus omega. C plus goes around the other point. Now you should be able to figure out, um, just a reminder, so 1 over k squared minus m squared is 1 over k0 squared minus omega squared. So this integrand diverges, diverges at k0 equals plus or minus omega. Now I hope you remember um, Cauchy's residue theorem. Cauchy's residue theorem. residue theorem. So if I have a complex function, um, if I have a complex function that can be expanded, I'm not really going to do this properly. Let me just, you should, you should, you should know all this, but just think that you need refreshing your memory. If the complex function can be expanded like this, around the point z0, so this is a function in the complex plane, which is not necessarily analytic everywhere. Um, so this quantity v1 is the residue, the residue Point Z is at zero, and Cauchy's residue theorem says that the integral of a function, a complex function around the curve C, is equal to 2 pi i multiplied by the sum of the residues. Sum of residues inside C. So if I integrate around some curve, complex function, I integrate it around the closed curve, the value is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues inside the, this region bounded by the curve. So if I integrate for, for this function here, it has, it diverges or it has poles, what are called poles, at these two points. If I integrate around this curve, then I get zero. Because there are no, if I integrate this function um, in the 
complex K0 plane around this curve, I get zero because there are no, no poles in that region. Um, homework problem, homework. So this will do, uh, do, do two things, this homework. One, maybe you'll revise a bit of Cauchy's residue theorem, and you'll check this formula that the expressions for um, delta plus and delta minus that we wrote down are reproduced, can be written like this. What you'll do <coughs> is you just split this, split the integral, just think about the k0 part, and um, you should find, let me just write down just to remind you, um, so delta plus, delta plus x is we define to be minus i over 2, 2 pi cubed times the integral d3k over omega e to the minus i k dot x. You should be able to show, if I take this four-dimensional integral and just do the integral over k0, around this curve, around this um, pole k0 plus omega, and you use Cauchy's integral, Cauchy's residue theorem, you should be able to show that this is the, so here I'm looking at the plus. So I'm integrating over C, ground C plus, you should find that it reduces to this. All right, you should be able to show that. Um, so there's a, a homework problem. Um, revise contour integrals a little bit. Um, why is this useful? Okay. Um, all right. Um, why is this useful? It's useful because it connects to the Feynman propagator, which finally um, as I mentioned to you, the whole motivation really, the, the bit about fields commuting space-like separated points is interesting, the microcausality, which as I said is intimately related to the spin statistics theorem. But more generally, for the purposes of this course, what's important is the Feynman propagator. When we come to do the Feynman rules, we write down, I ask you to calculate what is the probability you know, for electron-positron annihilation going to need the Feynman propagator to work out the answer. Feynman propagators are going to be appearing all over the place. By, by the end of this course, you will be dreaming about Feynman propagators. You will be pouring them on your cereal at breakfast. So the Feynman propagator is related to these functions. And um, where does it come from? All right, so first of all, um, something to note. We've said that come up when you do the perturbation series for interacting fields, you find that the terms contain what are called time-ordered products, which are defined like this. So let us say I have a field operator, product of field operators at two arbitrary space-time points, x and x prime. And again, just to confuse you, instead of x and y, I'm going back to x and x prime. x and x prime are two arbitrary points in space-time. Let's define the time-ordered product 
of, um, of this product is equal to, so it's equal to phi x, phi x prime if t is bigger than t prime and it's equal to, you swap the order, comes phi x prime phi x if um, t prime is bigger than t. So phi x phi x prime if t is bigger than t prime phi x prime phi x prime bigger than t. So what you're doing is you order Time runs from right to left, so the so the earlier earlier operators, if you like, act first. Okay, so if, if t prime is bigger than t, then I reorder this. I have it so the time is running this way. But x is earlier. This operator t is smaller. This is earlier. This is so earlier and later. Earlier and later. Time is running. Just order the operators. So the time runs from right to left, or if you like, earlier operators act first, whichever way you want to think about it. Now, you can write this, if you like, equally, you, this can be written as um, theta. Another way to write it is I can use the step function. T minus T prime. Just, just giving a bit of notation. This defines a time-ordered product. Now, why is this important? All right, well, here is the definition of the Feynman propagator. The definition of the Feynman propagator is the following. I times the Feynman propagator, the subscript F. Feynman. So the Feynman propagator is this thing delta F, but we, we multiply it by I. And this is defined to be the vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product. Definition of the Feynman propagator. So I times the Feynman propagator evaluated at the at this argument where which is equal to the separation of two arbitrary space-time points x and x prime is given by the vacuum expectation value of the time-ordered product of 
phi hat at x times phi hat at x prime. So if you imagine that I have two arbitrary space-time points, they might be space-like separated or not space-like separated, two arbitrary space-time points. If I take field operators at these two points and multiply them, and I take the time-ordered product, and then I take the average value in the vacuum, that defines the Feynman um, propagator. So, um, Just show you. Um, something. Um, all right. No. Splitting delta into delta plus and delta minus. Um, we have that expression, and what we can do, whoops, hang on, I've written down the wrong thing, sorry, I've written down, you know, that's not quite what I wanted. Sorry, that's not quite what I wanted. Uh, this one here, phi hat, sorry, phi hat plus. number at each point in space, I can take the vacuum expectation value of each side. Um, the vacuum expectation value of a number is just the same number. So in other words, this implies that I delta plus, and I'm going to replace y by x prime, just to confuse you, this is equal to the vacuum expectation value of that commutator. Um, now, if I write out that commutator, and I remember that phi plus contains annihilation operators only, and annihilation operators annihilate the vacuum. So it's only the first term in the commutator that contributes. So in fact, I have the following. This is true. Just the vacuum expectation value of this product is equal to that function. And now, once again, using the fact that the um, Well, let me just write down, you can also write this as follows. A product of the complete field, the sum of phi plus and phi minus. I can add phi plus here because phi plus contains annihilation operators, which annihilate the vacuum. So replacing phi minus by phi, where this is phi plus plus phi minus, doesn't make a difference phi plus part annihilates the vacuum. The phi plus as well, I can also replace by phi plus plus phi minus, because phi minus contains a dagger, 
which when acting this way annihilates the vacuum we get. So anyway, so you can write this like that. So if you look at this result, you realize that um, Remember the time ordered product can be written as the sum of products like this with the step functions. You see here that well the vacuum and then the final propagator is the vacuum expectation value. The vacuum expectation value of this product is equal to this delta plus. Go through this, check it through, you should be able to confirm that the Feynman propagator argument x can be written as theta t delta plus of x again let me write this as an important formula so let me make a special space and write this nicely find the propagate that x is equal to theta t delta plus of x minus theta minus t delta minus of x. Or, if you like, delta f of x is equal to, Feynman propagator is equal to plus delta plus of x or t positive, and it's equal to minus delta minus x for t negative. So as I said, this functions delta plus minus that we define we're defining at the beginning are related to the Feynman propagator. Now, the important thing to take away from all this is um, the Feynman propagator is what you want to be concerned about. The Feynman propagator, which is defined uh, as this time-ordered product, is related to these functions plus or minus that we've already defined, but we're not really going to worry too much about these functions delta plus or minus. What we're interested in is the Feynman propagator, and it turns out that the Feynman, remember that then we can write the delta plus and minus as contour integrals. So it turns out there's a nice expression for the Feynman propagator as a contour integral. And this is what you really want to worry about. And remember, the delta plus, delta minus is all just sort of building up to, um, building up to the Feynman propagator. What we're really interested in is the Feynman propagator. So here we have um, the Feynman propagator contour integral for delta f is given by the following. If you go back what we've done, the contour integrals for delta plus and delta minus, the fact that delta Feynman is can be written in terms of those, um, we have the following, something called the Feynman contour, which I'll draw for you in a moment. We have 1 over 2 pi to the 4 integral. Okay, the Feynman contour. What is the Feynman contour? So here we're in the complex K0 plane. And remember, we have these points. Um, this is the point. 
is omega. This is the point K is minus omega. The Feynman contour looks like this. Um, it goes along the real axis, and then it, it goes around, it skirts around um, that pole, K is minus omega. It carries along on the real axis, and then it skirts around the pole, the other pole this way, and it goes along. Now what you do is there is the question of how do you close the contour. Remember the contour is supposed to be closed. The contour, so here you go this way, you're going in this direction. The contour, if you so form, if the time is positive, if the time argument is positive, the contour has to be closed. Remember, this integral is really extending out to infinity along the, 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 the real line here. And, we have, and then we have this semicircle, which is going infinitely big. I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of thing, closing a contour in a contour integral. This is the, this is the Feynman contour. This is Cf for the case when the time is positive. If instead the time is negative, then the contour is closed up here. It goes up around that, up around the top. So what happens if time is positive, you close the contour this way, only this pole is enclosed. This pole is not in the contour. You pick up just this one. If time is negative, then the, the, the contour contains only this pole. Okay, so you pick up one or the other pole depending on the sign of the time. And what you should be able to show, if you go back through your notes and you look at how we've defined how the delta function, how the Feynman propagator is related to delta plus and delta minus, you should be able to see that, for instance, so e.g., why do I have to um, if x0 is positive, why do I have to close it at the bottom? The answer is that there's a term e to the minus i k0 x0 that appears in here, which this goes to 0 for k0 goes to minus i infinity. If I close the curve at the bottom, then the contribution to the contour integral on this semicircle, when the semicircle goes out to infinity, goes to zero, because the imaginary part, k0, is becoming, going towards minus i infinity. And if x0 is positive, then minus i infinity, I get a minus y, I get, you know, this goes e to the x to the minus infinity, which is zero. So in other words, the integrand goes to zero on this infinite semicircle, okay? So you know how to do this. Um, um, because of that, you should be able to show um, So remember, because of the step functions, when time is positive, the Feynman propagator is just delta plus. And before we had an expression for um, delta plus as a contour integral that looked like this, C plus. Two poles, 
and C plus was this here. It was just a con it was just a contour integral around that pole. You should be able to show that well these are either you should be able to derive this. It's pretty straightforward. So homework check that this is true. Um, it's pretty clear that the you know the, the um, anyway you should be able to, you, you should be able to see that that the um, for t for positive time this contour integral for the Feynman propagator reduces is exactly the same as this contour integral which is just what we had for delta plus so we recover the, 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 the what we already know that the Feynman propagator is equal to delta plus at positive times. And anyway, just confirming that this is um, that this is a contour integral representation of the Feynman propagator. Let me just make let they can wait. I'm just going to make one last little comment that the what is often called um, representation representation in momentum space momentum space is that the Feynman propagator in momentum space is equal to 1 over k squared minus m squared. If you look at this, you think, well, you know, this is, um, this is a contour integral, but it sort of looks a bit like a four-dimensional Fourier transform. And um, in fact, we're going to write it slightly differently. I don't have time to finish this next time. We're going to write this slightly differently. It looks a bit more like a four-dimensional Fourier transform. But um, the this quantity here, 1 over k squared minus m squared, is what appears in the Feynman rules. The Feynman rules are the rules that emerge from perturbation theory for various processes, scattering, part pair creation, all of these things. When you calculate, try to calculate these numbers, these probabilities, cross sections, and so on. The Feynman propagator appears all the time, but it usually appears in momentum space. So this quantity here, we're going to be using a lot. It's very important. It's basically, this is the Feynman propagator in momentum space. And um, ultimately, it comes from the vacuum expectation value of the time-ordered product of fields at different points. This seems obscure. Where I'm going to show you when we do the perturbation theory that you get a, um, a series of terms in the perturbation series that contain such time order products. And that's where how these functions end up appearing in the results of the final rules. So um, next time, Thursday, we're just going to write this again in a slightly different form that's a bit more common. And then we're going to do the Dirac field. Thursday, we're going to do the Dirac field. Be ready. Four component complex spinner field stuff of 1990s.